Hello everyone, we're here today to talk about Math 121, Section 3.3, and this section deals with measures of relative standing. And to start off, we have a z-score. A z-score is the number of standard deviations a given data value is above or below the mean. A z-score uses the mean and the standard deviation to compare the data values. You're finding its position relative, relative, right, to the mean in terms of standard deviations. We have two formulas. The first is z equals x minus x bar over s. x minus x bar over s. Your data value minus your mean over your standard deviation. The other formula is z equals x minus mu over sigma. Notice they're the same formula. This one's for population. This one's for samples, right? That's a common theme we have seen so far, right? Now, what about properties? We got four properties. The first property is going to be a reminder of the definition. I know we just defined it, but the first property is a z-score tells us how many standard deviations a data value is from the mean. That is the most important property of the z-score, that it tells how many standard deviations a data value is from the mean. It tells us how many standard deviations a data value is from the mean. Now, z-scores have no units. z-scores have no units. So if your original data is feet, let's say you're measuring lengths of houses, right? You're measuring lengths of houses. How, how long is a house? How many feet long is a house? And you got a whole bunch of data, and you calculate some z-scores. Your z-scores do not have feet as its unit. There is no unit for z-scores. Keep that in mind. No units. And then, z-scores of negative 2 or less are significant significantly low, z-scores of negative 2 or less are significantly low, and 2 or greater are significantly high, significantly high. We can talk about the significantly low and significantly high values using the z-scores. This is the range rule of thumb. If you want to write that, range rule of thumb. Z-scores that are negative 2 or less. That means it's two standard deviations below or more from the mean. That's the range rule of thumb, right? Significantly low. Similarly, significantly high is 2 or greater, right? And then the last part is z-scores are negative when the data value is less than the mean. Z-scores are negative when the data value is less than the mean should make sense. Data value minus mean. If this number is smaller than this number, it's going to be negative, right? That's how subtraction works, right? If the, um, the second number is larger, we get negative values, right? Now, rounding rules. Rounding rules for z-scores are actually kind of easy. It's always two decimal places. 
always two decimal places. Always, always, always. So for example, maybe you get 1.92. That's an example, right? 1.92. It's always two decimal places, just like money, right? Money is always two decimal places. Z-scores are always two decimal places. Don't forget, the rounding rules are always the same, always two. Now, let's look at an example. Determining which value is more extreme. Which value is farther away from the mean relative to the data set it came from, right? Which value is more extreme relative to the data set from which it came. We need to calculate the z-scores for each of these values. Now notice, the first value is a 4,000 gram baby, and it's taken from a sample of 400 weights with a mean of 3152 and a standard deviation of 693.4. So I'm going to calculate the z-score, part one. Z equals, let's see, my data value in question is 4,000, right? Minus the mean. So I do 4,000 minus the mean, 3152.0, doesn't matter, right? Over the standard deviation, 693.4. And let's see what I get. 4,000 minus 3152 divided by 693.4 gives me 1.22295593. I go to two decimal places, 1.22. 1 1.22. Now, that's the z-score for the baby. What about my second data point? Well, let's see. The 99 degree Fahrenheit temperature of an adult from a sample of 106 with a mean of 98.2 and a standard deviation of 0.62. Well, this z-score is going to be equal to, I take the data value, 99, I subtract the mean, 98.2, and I divide by the standard deviation, 0 0.62. That's the formula for z-scores. So, I'm going to type it in my calculator, 99 minus 98.2, and then divide that by 0 0.62, gives me, let's see, 1.29. Remember, always two decimal places. So, we ask ourselves, which of these numbers is farther away from zero? 1.29 is farther away from zero. Whichever number, whichever z-score is farther away from zero means that data value is more standard deviations away from the mean. If this 1.29 was negative, it would still be the answer, because 1.29 whether it's positive or negative, is always farther away from zero than 1.22. So remember, negative numbers, you need to consider how far away from zero it is, not just which number is bigger, right? So this one is farther from zero. So the temperature, the temperature, the temp of 99 degrees Fahrenheit is more extreme because it is farther away from the average. It's farther away from the mean. That's what this number tells you. Be careful with negative numbers. Because, for example, if we had negative 2.2 and positive 1.5. Negative 2.2 and positive 1.5. Negative 2.2 is farther from zero. So that would be the more extreme value. Make sure you're looking at which number is farther from zero, right? That's which one is more extreme. Now, we can go to the second page. On the second page, it says using z-scores to identify significant values. We want to use z-scores to identify significant values. Well, first, I'm going to draw a number line. And I'm going to put three dashes on it that are roughly equally spaced, because I want them to be equally spaced. This one will be z equals negative 2. This one will be z equals 0. And this one will be z equals 2. This is also the mean, whether you're using population or sample. z equals 0 is always the mean, because the mean is 0 standard deviations away from itself, right? 
Now, these values, z equals 2 and bigger, are significantly high, right? We just said that. Significantly high if there's z equals 2 or bigger. On the flip side, if there's z equals negative 2 or smaller, they are significantly low, right? That's what we just said on the previous page. This is the range rule of thumb. I am just using it in terms of z-scores now. And then mu and x bar and everything from here to here, not including negative 1 and 2, right? These values in the middle are not significant. They're not significant if they are between negative 2 and 2. If they're equal, they are significantly low or high, right? Be careful with that. Make sure you know that if it is negative 2, it is significantly low. If it is 2, it is significantly high. But in between is not significant. So let's look at a real example. An adult patient comes in with a platelet count of 75 kilocells per microliter. That's a weird unit, right? It doesn't matter what the unit is, but that's the unit for measuring platelet count, is kilocells per microliter. Now, Let's see, if we assume that for all adults, the average, the mean, is 23.94 kilocells per microliter, and the standard deviation is 64.2 kilocells per microliter, then does this patient have a significantly low platelet count? I.e., does this patient suffer from thrombocytopenia? We are trying to determine if our patient has this condition, which is when they have a significantly low platelet count. So I have a data value, a mean, and a standard deviation, and I see the word significantly low. I know I need to calculate a z-score. So z equals, I'm going to plug in, uh, let's see, 75 minus, let's see, 239.4, right? It's the data value minus the mean over the standard deviation, 64.2. So we'll take our calculator, let's see, 75 minus 239.4, and then we divide by 64.2. Be careful, we want to make sure we remember it's a negative number, right? That's what this little minus here means. And I get 2.56. Remember, we always round to two decimal places. So let's see, is that significantly low? Uh, yeah, that's smaller than negative 2, right? So yes. The patient has a significantly low platelet count. That is what this information just told me. That means that this patient does suffer from thrombocytopenia, most likely. I would want to make sure, if I was the attending doctor or physician or nurse, that Given these results, I would want to make sure the patient gets the appropriate treatment, right? And that is z-scores. That is one concept of relative standing. Now, we also have percentiles. Now, percentiles are a type of way of looking at the relative standing, but slightly different. A percentile are measures of location... They measure location. Our measures of location, which divide a set of data into 100 groups. The 100 should make sense because it's percent aisle, right? There should be 100 groups. So I'm taking my data set and dividing it into 100 groups. The formula, the formula is the percentile for my data value x. So the percentile for x is equal to the number of values less than x over the total number of values, the total number of values. 
the total number of values. And then you multiply that by 100. So I take the number of values less than x, divided by the total number of values, and multiply by 100. Now, the rounding rules, you round to the nearest whole number. You always round to the nearest whole number. Percentiles have to be a whole number. So you round to the nearest whole number for percentiles. Now, what does the 60th percentile mean? Let's say you just took exam one, and I tell you you scored in the 60th percentile. That does not mean that you got 60% of the questions right. This is a measure of location. What this means is that 60% of the other data values were less than the data value in question. Sixty percent of the other data values were less than the data value in question. That's what the 60th percentile means. That the data value you're looking at, if that data value is the 60th percentile, it is above 60% of the other data. It doesn't actually tell you how strong or good the data value is, right? All it does is compare it as a location with the rest of the data. That is what percentiles do. Do not confuse percentiles and percentages. They are different. They're based on the same idea of breaking things into, like, groups of 100, right? But they're doing it in different ways. Don't confuse percentile with percentages. So percentile are measures of location. So let's look here. Let's do some examples of percentile. Let's take a look here. So finding a percentile. The following table lists 50 cell phone data speeds. Find the percentile for the data speed of 11.8 megabits per second. So the first thing I want to do is find the number 11.8 in my list. Now notice my list is already in order. If your list is not in order, you need to order your list first. If you want to talk about location, you better have things ordered first. Now, here is 11.8. It's right there. Now, the formula says the percentile for 11.8 is equal to, and let's bring our previous sheet, let's, let's, let's take a peek. What was it? What was it? The percentile for x is equal to the number of values less than x. So how many of these numbers are less than x? Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There's 20 numbers here that are smaller than 11.8. 20 of them are less than 11.8. Now, what else did I need? Let's see, I divide by the total number. How many in total? There were 50 in total. So I'll divide by 50 and multiply by 100. So let's see, 20 divided by 50 times 100 gives me 40. So the 40th percentile, which we sometimes abbreviate P sub 40. P for percentile, 40 for 40th. Sometimes we abbreviate P sub 40. Now, if I typed it in and got a decimal, I'd round to the nearest whole number, right? So we'll keep that in mind. Now next, we have a flow chart. What if we want to go in reverse? What if you're given a percentile and you want to find the data value for it? Well, this flow chart will help us. It says, start. Step one, sort the data. All right. Step two, compute L equals K over 100 times N. This formula, K over 100 times N, is super important. It says N is the number of values and K is the percentile in question. L is the locator. That's why it's L. You are using it to locate the number you're looking for. 
So I compute this number. Then I ask myself, is L a whole number, yay or nay? And I do different things depending on whether it is or is not. If it is not a whole number, let's say I get a decimal, right? I round it up to the next whole number, and my answer is that number th value. If the answer is a whole number, then the value is halfway between that value and the next one. Now, I think the table, while helping us keep ourselves on track, can be a little confusing, so let's do an example first. Let's take a look at an example. Now, use the same table as before to find which data speed corresponds to the 25th percentile. So let's see, step one, sort my data. So I sort my data. I'm done, it already was sorted. Step two, compute L. All right, let's see, L equals, let's see, K. The percentile in question is 25 over, it's always 100, right? It's always 100. So K is the percentile in question, and N is the number of values. N is your sample size, right? It's how many values you have. There were 50 values here. So I'm going to do 25 over 100 times 50. That gives me 12 0.5. I computed this L value. I computed the locator. Is L a whole number? Is 12.5 a whole number? No. Round it up to the next whole number. So I'll round up to 13. Even if this was 12.0001, you would still round it up to 13. It says round up. Round up. So even if it wouldn't normally round to 13, you still round up because that's what it tells you to round. So I get 13. So this tells me the 13th value is the 25th percentile, or P sub 25 if we prefer, right? We could have written P25 instead. Which of these is the 13th number? Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So 7.9 megabits per second is P25, right? Because 7.9 megabits per second was the 13th number in this list. So it will be the 25th percentile. Now, let's do the same thing, but look for the 40th percentile. So we're looking for P40 now. Well, we still got to do L equals, let's see, K is now 40, right? L equals K over 100, over 100. N, well, N didn't change, right? I'm still talking about the same data set. So this will still be 50. This is N, right? It's always how big your data set is. If you had 100 numbers in your data set, this would be 100. If you had 10,000 numbers in your data set, this would be 10,000. It's how many numbers you had, right? Well, I type this in, let's see, 40 divided by 100 times 50 gives me 20. Now, I didn't, get, I got a whole number, didn't I? So is L a whole number? Yes. The value of the answer is midway between that value and the next. So I want to go midway between the 20th and 21st value. That is what this block of text is telling me. The value of the percentile is midway between the lth value, the 20th value, and the next value, the 21st value. Midway. Midway. To find a number midway, I can add those two numbers together, right? So... Let's see, P40 is equal to, let's see, I need the 20th number. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 20. 11 20. 11.6 is the 20th number. 11.6 plus, let's see, I need the 21st number. Let's see, 21st would be 11.8. And I divide them by 2 to find the number midway between them, right? That's how we find a number halfway between two numbers. We add them together and divide by two. 
Let's see, if I add 11.6 plus 11.8 and divide by 2, I get 11.7 megabits per second. So the 40th percentile is 11.7 megabits per second. Oh, wait a minute. Something funky's going on. Earlier, I said 11.8 was the 40th percentile. But now I'm telling me it's 11.7? There's disagreement there, isn't there? Huh. That's okay. Because how many groups does the percentile break the data into? 100 groups, right? Is every data set going to be able to easily broken into 100 equal groups? No. It only can be broken into even groups if you have 100 values or multiples of 100 as your values, right? You can have 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. Those can all be broken into even groups of um, 100 different even groups, right? But 50 numbers cannot be broken up nicely into 100 groups. There's going to be inconsistencies with percentiles. So always calculate with percentiles. Never assume. Always calculate. Always follow the flowchart or the formula, depending on which way you're going, right? If you're given the data value, it's just the formula, right? If you're given the percentile, you have to, if you're given the percentile, you have to use the flow chart. So keep that in mind. There may be discrepancies with percentiles because you're trying to break a group of data into 100 different groups. That doesn't always work out nice and evenly. So just be careful of those discrepancies. They are going to happen. Now, we have one more uh, idea we want to talk about, and that is quartiles. Quartiles divide a data set into four subgroups. They are the values that divide the data set into four different subgroups. They're also measures of location. Measures of location, right? They're related to percentiles. Instead of percent aisle, it's quart aisle. That's why it's four instead of 100, right? Now, if I want to divide, let's say I want to divide this rectangle into four equal subgroups. Well, how many times do I have to slice it? One, two, three and three. There's three quartiles to make four subgroups, right? First, second, and third quartile. You only need to cut something three times to divide it into four subgroups, right? So the first quartile is P25, or the 25th percentile. The first quartile has 25% of the data below it. The first quartile has 25% of the data below it. That is the first quartile. It is the 25th percentile. The second quartile is P50, or the 50th percentile. Or the median. These are all the same idea. Second quartile, P50, 50th percentile, and median all mean the exact same thing. Now, the second quartile has 50% of the data below it. So, the second quartile has 50% of the data below it. The third quartile is P75, or the 75th percentile. And I'm sure you can guess it has 75% of the data below it. Has 75% of the data below it. Those are the quartiles. Quartiles are just specific percentiles we're looking for. 25, 50, and 75. Those are the three percentiles we want. Now, the symbols we use, the first quartile is Q with a little 1 as a subscript, right? Q1. 
The second quartile is Q2, or you can call it the median. Be sure you recognize that it's both, right? And then the third quartile is Q3. So we use Q1, 2, and 3 to represent first, second, and third quartiles. Now, a caution. A caution. There may be some discrepancies, discrepancies with percentiles and quartiles. And we have already seen that come up. Because is every group of data evenly divisible into 100 subgroups? No. Similarly, is every group of data evenly divisible into four subgroups? If my data set has 57 things in it, there's 57 data values, can I evenly divide that into four groups? No, 57 doesn't divide by four. So be careful. There may be some discrepancies with percentiles and quartiles given the size of the data set. Always calculate them. Always use the mathematics to calculate your quartiles and your percentiles. Do not assume your quartiles and percentiles. Always use the formulas or the flowcharts we were given. Now, the five number summary. The five number summary is a list of five statistics for a data set. Specifically, what five statistics are in the five number summary? Which of the five I want to use? Well, they are the minimum. That seems like a good first value to use. The second one is Q1. The third one is the median. The fourth one is Q3. And the last one is the maximum. You look at the minimum, the maximum, and the quartiles, right? Remember, the median is also known as Q2, right? The median is also known as Q2. So make sure you recognize when the median and Q2 are the same thing, right? Make sure you know that, you recognize that. These are the five numbers in question. Minimum, first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, max. So, let's find a five number summary. Let's find the five number summary for this data set we were working with earlier. Well, the five number summary is gonna be the min, Q1, the median, Q3, and the max. I already know that. I already know min, Q1, median, Q3, and max are going to be my answers. Let's get the easy ones out of the way. The minimum, 0 0.8 megabits per second. Don't forget your units. It was megabits per second earlier. Don't forget your units. The max, 77.8 megabits per second. Now, I need to find Q1, the median, and Q3. To do this, Q1 is, remember, Q1 is equal to P25, right, the 25th percentile. So I'm going to use my locator, L, is equal to, remember, it's K over 100 times N. So let's see, let's calculate L for Q1. Let's see, 25 over 100 times, let's see, n. n is 50, right? There's 50 data values. Let's see, 25 over 100 times 50 is 12.5. If you remember from the flow chart, when you get a decimal, you round it up to 13. So Q1 is the 13th number. It's not 13, it's the 13th number. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 11, 12, 13. 7.9 megabits per second. So that is the Q1. Now, I also need to do Q3. 
Now remember Q3 is the same as P75, right? The third quartile is the 75th percentile. So the locator, this time K will be 75 over 100 times 50, which is going to give me 37.5, which is a decimal. When I calculate this, I get a decimal, which remember, the flow chart tells me to round to 38. So I need to find the 38th number to give me Q3. Let's see. 1, 2, 3. This is going to be 30, right? 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. 21.5 megabits per second. So I have everything except the median. There are two ways to calculate the median. The way we have been doing it, where we cross off from each end, and we can also remember that the median, remember, the median is the 50th percentile. It should give me the same answer. So I'm going to try the locator. Locator. Let's see. The 50th percentile, so that'll be 50 over 100. And let's see, i got to multiply it by the size of the data set. That gives me 50. And this gives me 25. Remember, when you get a whole number, you also have to look at the next number. So I'm going to look at the 25th and 26th numbers. That should make sense that I got two values because if I crossed off from each end and I started with 50 numbers, when I get down to the middle, that's going to be right here, which are 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26, right? If I cross off from each end, imagine crossing off, you know, Top row and bottom row both have 10, and then 10. And then if I cross off from both ends, right, I'm going to be left with those two numbers in the middle also. Either strategy will leave me with those two numbers left over. What's halfway between 13.7 and 14.1? Well, if you do a little bit of algebra, right, if you add them together and divide by 2, you get 13.9 megabits per second. So the median is 13.9 megabits per second. So this is my five number summary. Notice I had to use the locator a lot in this problem, right? Make sure you're comfortable using this locator equation because it tells you the locations of percentiles and quartiles, right? It also helps us with the median. If we so choose, we could have crossed off for the median. That would have worked too. We'd have gotten the same answer either strategy. Now we have one last topic, but it relates directly to what we were just talking about, and box and whisker plots, or box plots as some people like to call them. A box and whisker plot is a type of graph, is a graph of the five number summary. It's a graph of the five number summary extending from the max to the min, or the min to the max, right? The max to the min, and a box with lines at Q1, Q2, which is also the median, right? We want to get used to these different phrases for the same concept and Q3. Remember, Q2 is the median, don't forget. Procedure for creating, there's a couple steps. Step one, find the five number summary. Step two, draw a line segment with endpoints at the max and min. Step three, construct a box from Q1 to Q3 with a line at 
the median at Q2. So we find the five number summary, we draw a line segment, and then we construct the box. Once you see a picture of one of these, it'll make a lot more sense about the procedure for creating. So let's look at the example first. So the first thing it says is use the same data set we have been to create the box and whisker. I'm going to copy the five number summary down. The five number summary, the min, we calculated on the previous page to be 0 0.8 MBPS. Q1 was 7.9 MBPS. The median was 13.9 MBPS. Q3 was 21.5 MBPS. And the max was 77.8 MBPS. So the first step would be calculating this, but we had already calculated it, so that was nifty for us. So let's draw the box and whisker. The first step is to draw a line segment from max to min. Well, the min was 0 0.8, and the max was 77.8. Now, I'm going to treat this like a number line that goes from 0 0.8 to 77.8. Now, I need to draw a line at each of these three values, 7.9. That's pretty close over here, right? 7.9. 13.9, let's see, 13.9, also pretty close over here, right, 13.9, 21.5, also over here, right, 77.8 is very far from the other three values here, right, and then I connect them in a box-like fashion in the middle. Notice it looks like a box with two whiskers, one whisker being longer than the other, right, it's a box and whisker plot, it's a box plot. So they always look like this. You draw a line segment from minimum to maximum, and then draw a box with Q1, the median, and Q3. Some people like to label min, Q1, median, Q3. You could have put Q2 here, and then max. You could have also put P25, P75, or P50. There's a ton of different things we can put as labels, right? We have a bunch of different terminologies available to us. But the important thing is we're able to draw this box, right, from Q1 to Q3 with the median in the middle somewhere, and then the endpoints being the whiskers, right? And that is the end of section 3.3. Thank you for stopping by, and I will see you next time.